so. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a tradition at the Religious Freedom Project where we try to be on time, and we try to begin and end on time. Usually we are uh, pretty close to that. Uh, unfortunately, our moderator is in a cab on the way here from Union Station, and it's impossible to predict what she will encounter. So rather than wait and have the uncertainty, we're going to go ahead and begin. Eliza Griswold is the, is the moderator. So when she comes in, uh, we have students who will bring her up. And my colleague, Kent Hill, who will be on a later panel, is sitting to my left and is going to kick us off. So it'll be a little awkward when we make that exchange, but I think it will, it will be worth doing so we can go ahead and get started on this terribly, terribly important panel. So Kent, take it away. Thanks. Thank you, Tom, and uh, thank you for coming back. And uh, we're looking forward to this next uh, panel. This next panel addresses uh, advocacy and civil society perspectives on the, the big issue of the day, the, uh, the threats to religious and ethnic minorities within the Islamic uh, State. I'm just going to be up here for a few minutes. I have the privilege of introducing our four uh, panelists, and what I'm going to do, and I'm going to turn to each of them in turn, they're going to have about five minutes or so to give their name, their organization, and to say just a little bit about how they and their organization are trying to address this question in general terms. And so first I'm going to turn to Murad Ismail, and he's going to introduce himself, and then we will go on from there. Uh, hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be here today. Murad Ismail, I'm the executive director of Yazda organization. Yeah. Is it working now? Is it working? I think the issue is not there. Yeah, it's working now. So, um, why don't you take mine here? Mine's working. Yeah. I think it doesn't work all the time. It is. Sorry about this. Excuse me. We just got to Yeah. We'll wait. Sir. Try this. Um, That's better. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Murad Ismail. I'm the executive director of Yazda organization. It's a global Yazid organization that was established after uh, August uh, 3rd, 2014, when the Islamic State attacked our community in Shingal. Uh, I uh, work with this group to, uh, to create Yazda and to provide different uh, humanitarian uh, uh, services to the Yazidi community, including two clinics, one psychosocial program for the women, uh, a case management program, a documentation program, in addition to our work that we do internationally uh, advocating for the Yazidi cause. Okay, Mona. Is mine working? Yes, can you hear me? No, no. no okay. Mic. All right. Uh, my name is Mona Malik, and I'm with the Assyrian Aid Society of America. And I, am, uh, I was born in Baghdad. I left when I was very young. Um, I have visited Iraq uh, a couple of times, and I plan to be there uh, again very shortly. The reason I am up here today uh, is because I am representing someone who wasn't allowed to leave the country to be here, uh, Ashar Khariya, the pre uh, president of the Assyrian Aid Society of Iraq. So if you see me reading uh, most of my answers, it's because I want them to be his answers, and I am representing, I am his voice, uh, and the Assyrian Aid Society of Iraq's voice, because uh, just as uh, Bishop Royal said, is we, uh, as Assyrians of diaspora, have uh, no right and are not in any position to dictate to uh, the Assyrians living in the homeland uh, as to what they should be doing or not doing, we are here to serve them. And that's why I'm here speaking for them um, in his words, in his answers. Um, and how we have tried to uh, work with this crisis is uh, on a uh, humanitarian uh, perspective. Uh, when uh, Assyrian A Society's focus has always been education and infrastructure, well, that focus has been shifted for the last two years because Though that funding um, has to go toward uh, uh, helping the IDPs and refugees. Um, and we are hoping that we return back to our focus of education um, 
and infrastructure once again to help our Assyrian Christians in the homeland. Thanks, Mona and Rajab. I think it's working. Okay, yeah. there you go. Yeah, good morning all. I am Ali Zainal Abdin Al Bayati. I'm actually a neologist and chief of Turkmenistan Foundation. Uh, it is an NGO, Iraq-based NGO. We're okay, working. Can you, sorry, can you speak slower because we're not. Uh, yeah, sorry. You're talking too fast. For us. Yeah. Uh, I am Ali Zainal Abdin Al Bayati. Uh, actually, I am neologist doctor, uh, chief of Turkmenistan Foundation, which is an Iraq-based NGO working with a group of volunteers in Iraq, and we have many representatives outside of Iraq, including America, UK, and other countries. We are trying to increase awareness about the suffering of Turkmen in Iraq, and even outside of Iraq, according to our uh, facility. We are working mainly in documentation and reporting, in media work, depending on our simple facilities. We have a web-based Turkmen news agency. We are depending on social media and attending conferences and international sessions to uh, increase the awareness of uh, suffering of our people because the suffering of Turkmen return back to many decades and it is not uh, new things uh, return to uh, 30s of the century. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. أنا رجب عاصي كاكي بين قوسين اليارسانية. أم رجب عاصي الكركجي. كاكي. الكاكي. سنة 2003 أسسنا جمعية يارسان الثقافية والاجتماعية التي تعني بالثقافة الكاكية. ومن سنة 2005 إلى 2009 كنت رئيس مركز كركوكلا. وبعد صرت مستشار في نفس الجمعية وكذلك أنا الآن أعمل على منظمة أخرى تعني بالثقافة والتنمية اليارسانية أنا أعمل في مؤسسة لنشر الثقافة الكاكائية وأصبح سوري سوري شانسة 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 أمير يعني أنا yeah, um, uh, we're working in an, uh, in an organization spreading the Kakai uh, culture, and I've been head of this organization since, uh, since uh, the year 2003. 2003. Uh, as of 2005, I've been the uh, official in charge of the Kirkuk Center for this organization. وبعد أصبحت مستشار العلاقات والإعلام لنفس الجمعية. Then I became a consultant for for information and media for the same organization. وحاليا أنا الشخص الثالث من تمثيل الكاكية في وزارة الأوقاف وشؤون الدينية في إقليم كردستان. And currently I'm number three in the representatives of the Kakai community in the in the Ministry of Kurdistan. Yes. وكذلك أعمل الآن على تأسيس منظمة ميترا للتنمية والثقافة اليارسانية. And now I'm also establishing an organization called the Mitra for development and and culture in my community in the Kakai community. وكذلك أنا عضو ديوان التنوع العراقي في مجلس حوار الأديان. I'm also a member of the Council of Diversity. In the Iraqi Council for, uh, for religious dialogue, and I'm, uh, I'm also the representative of the Kaka'i movement in this council. Good, thank you very thank much. You. Thanks. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take the liberty of asking you one question. I don't have Eliza's questions, so I can ask anything I want. But uh, I know from working in a variety of organizations that anybody who's involved in advocacy or civil society, the temptation is to believe that that kind of activity doesn't have much impact once you've come to a situation where violence is occurring. If one of the actors is, in this case, attacking religious or ethnic minorities. So my question for, for any of you is this question. 
in a situation like this, who is the focus of your advocacy on? Who are you trying to persuade of what to improve the situation relative to the ethnic and religious minorities in these situations? Anybody want to uh, take a crack at answering that question? Mm. Yeah, right. Mike? Well, whoever. You can if you wish. You understood what I said there? Yeah, you, you want to say something? Okay. While you talk, I'm going to go ahead and let uh, you speak. So I think, um, is this working? So in uh, situations like this, I think... Yeah. Uh, in situations like this, when you basically entire communities find themselves um, without uh, uh, without defense in the hands of a group that believes in nothing but the killing, enslavement, rape, a, a group that basically have no morals of responsibilities. And in, in the past, we've all seen many wars. Uh, all the wars, there is some moral in it. What the so-called Islamic State did had no basis of moral in it. Uh, they attacked entire communities with the intentions to wipe them out and their own community, the, uh, the, the, the fraction of the community that they, they say that we represent, in any case they didn't agree with them, they came also to persecute them. So we, we all found ourselves um, uh, in a situation where we really didn't know what to do for a small community like my community, the Yazidi community, we found ourselves uh, facing two choices, to convert or to die, and, and neither of the two choices we like to have. Uh, for the women uh, was to be taken, and the children to be taken. Uh, I think uh, the advocacy that, that we've done through Yazda was uh, focused on two things, of collecting a lot of information, because once you have the information, then, then you can use that information to, uh, to approach the government. Uh, for example, the beginning of the attack, we collected information about 6,000 Yazidi women and children as they were taking them, uh, their locations, what was happening. So this information becomes a tool of us to do the advocacy. Uh, and then the approach was to the, basically to the governments and then to a certain extent to the media. If you don't have media with you, then it's very hard to make any advance. I think with any cause like this, you have to have a lot of media coverage. You have to have uh, uh, communication with the governments. But then once you bring also other NGOs, uh, other advocacy groups, then you have more people working with you. Uh, and in my experience that we became more active as we had more players coming in and advocating, uh, advocating for this cause. But you're, the point of your advocacy is to get somebody to intervene on behalf of your community. In behalf of our community, but in behalf of the humanity as a whole, to me is what the Islamic State is doing uh, is uh, beyond uh, uh, anything that we've ever seen. And when we advocate for our community, I think we advocate on behalf okay. of all the communities. Okay, good. Mona? Um, yeah, I would just uh, also like to add um, to my colleague uh, from Yezda is that not only were we not prepared to defend ourselves, uh, but we were disarmed uh, prior to ISIS coming in, and we weren't um, allowed to be part of the security. So we had no way of defending ourselves. So the, uh, when, when we had a few hours just to escape um, from you know, Mosul, Baghdad, Qaraqah, and all those areas, um, they literally, literally left with the clothes um, on their back. And... Um, it, when, when they say that, it's not just words, it's, it's actually reality. So who, who we um, go to uh, to bring awareness is the international community, uh, like my colleague said, the UN, who has still not recognized uh, the genocide of the minorities, and they must do that to bring justice to uh, the, the victims of, of genocide, of ISIS. So uh, yeah, international community, the UN, the US, uh, as much as possible, and also within our own communities to um, rise up. I mean, this is uh, a crime against all humanity, not just against the minorities. Yeah. I think it's working, thank you. Uh, good morning again for all. Uh, if I answer on question of my colleague about focus of our work, I think it is our duty to work for all humanity and all human beings. Yeah, we are specialized every one of us. Uh, each one of uh, us in, in certain minority issue, 
This is because, unfortunately, the new democracy in Iraq forced us to think about our religion, to think about ethnicity, and to think more about our own sectarian. So the democracy in Iraq, unfortunately, started in dividing everything in Baghdad according to Shia, Sunni, Kurds. Then the all other minority have been marginalized, and this forced us to think more about that. This is what happened in Iraq. So I am a Turkman, and, and, and I am working for Turkmen because there is a need, a necessity in the ground about that. But I am at the same time working for all people as a doctor, I am, uh, it is, it is uh, my duty to work for all humanity and all human beings. So as a Turkman, I think uh, there is another thing that Turkman always forgotten. I think most of you not uh, uh, know about Turkman. Turkman is the third ethnicity in Iraq and, it is, and we are representing about 7 to 10% of Iraq, Iraqi population according to uh, all the census data. 7 to 10 per, uh, percent of Iraqi population. We are extending from northwest of Iraq at the Iraqi Turkish Syrian border till mid eastern uh, Iraqi border or Iraqi Iranian border. As an NGO, uh, we are working to, as a group of uh, activists, as a volunteers, to uh, make the others know the realities because the problem, the main problem of minorities in Iraq, that the facts is hidden. No one knows the facts. I think what happened in ISIS is not new. It belonged back to many decades. But the media started to uh, convey some things. And this is what we need. Actually, we need the most important thing here is to make something or establish something to uh, make the reality reach all the international community. All the international community, as they started and participated in, in, in establishing new democracy in Iraq at 2003, they are also have another duty to reevaluate what happened in Iraq. We have thousands of Yazidi have been abducted and raped and killed. Uh, hundreds of women have been uh, raped and killed by burning. Uh, and thousands have been killed over these years. So USA, uh, we thank the USA government about this opportunity, about these activities. But at the same time, we ask them to reevaluate what happened on these 13 years and what happened on the minorities. I think our suffering is too much. The most important issue as a Turkmen, I want to talk about the, uh, prob uh, the issue of abducted Turkmen women. We have, according to our report, which uh, published, reported and published since uh, one year, we have about 1,200 Turkmen civilians have been abducted by ISIS, 600 of them women and girls, 120 children, the women, uh, the the uh, strange thing, which is different from Yazidi, that uh, they, the ISIS, after rapping, they killed them by beheading, by burning them. And there was uh, an entity at Bashir, uh, at uh, west of Kirkuk, Bashir village, which is Turkmen village. They raped uh, about nine Turkmen girls, and they burned them, and they used even to hang them on the electricity lines. At uh, Tel Afar, the first woman had been killed was parliamentarian and she was activist and she was our colleague. She, she was head of an organization. They abducted her with, with her husband and then they killed her by beheading. So this is what happened. Another thing what I want to talk also, which is important thing, and, and the international community uh, didn't do anything for, for us. In March 2016, uh, ISIS attacked uh, uh, Taza district in the west of Kirkuk. Uh, and the, the, the attack was, was with chemical weapons. And till today, we have about 6,000 uh, victims, including all degree of, of, of affected person. I am talking uh, about burning uh, condition, about uh, ch chest problems, lung problems. And as a doctor, I know that most of them for the future, because they was chemical weapon, they are prone to develop uh, long-term carcinoma, long-term lung fibrosis. Who's responsible? Who will protect them? We know that the facilities in Iraq is very poor. So we need actual uh, steps and action about that. Okay, thank you so much. The, we, will, we will get to each of your points and we will get to them in detail because I think the point of today is really to understand what's not being reported. Why are we not hearing about what's happening to minorities under ISIS? And what do some of the solutions look like? So thank you so much. And we'll break that down a little bit so people can follow along. So, so, 
No, no, 6,000 injured or affected, uh, three killed, yeah. In Tel Afar? Yeah. Under no, this chemical? No, in Taza Hormato after a chemical attack. Okay, in the chemical attack. Yeah, yeah. Okay. total number of victims, I mean simple degree burn or chest problem till severe degree, or well, some of them have been killed. Yeah, yeah. And see, that's why this is so essential, because yeah. that has gone virtually unreported. Okay. Yeah. So I want to, sir, I want to give you a chance to, to finish the question. Uh, thank you. أنا أنتهز الفرصة للتعريف الكاكائية الاسم يجوز سيد أرشد والنواب القادمون من العراق يعرفونه ولكن المجتمع الغربي لا يعرفون من هم الكاكائية لذا أقل من دقيقة للتعريف عن الكاكائية فقط. الاسم الأصلي للكاكية هو يارسان وهي ديانة مستقلة. يارسان is the the real name of the kakai and it is an independent religion. تعود جذورها للديانة الميترائية قبل آلاف السنين. derived from the Mithraean religion that goes back thousands of years. يتوزعون اليارسان في العراق وفي إيران وفي إيران يسمونهم بأهل الحق والعراق يسمونهم الكاكية. Um, they live in Iraq and Iran. In Iran, they are known as the people of the truth, and in Iraq, they are known as the Kakais. ويعيش في العراق حوالي مئتين ألف إلى مئتين وخمسين ألف ليس لدينا إحصائيات دقيقة لعدم وجود إحصائيات في العراق والنواب سيد النواب يعرفون ذلك. In Iraq, there are between two hundred thousand Kakais and two hundred thousand and fifty. We cannot be uh, completely sure of the numbers. Because there have been no proper statistics about the numbers of the community. واليوم أنا كمواطن عراقي يتحدث عن الكاكية اليارسان في العراق. And today I'm here as an Iraqi citizen who are talking about the Kakai communities or the Yasans in Iraq. من المعلومة الكاكية هم من ناحية القومية كراد ومن ناحية دينية ليسوا مسلمين. Can you say this in all the Iltani? من المعلوم الكاكية اليارسان. كقومية نرجع أكراد ونصوصنا الدينية مكتوبة بالكردية. Ethnically we are Kurdish and our religious texts are written in the Kurdish language. وديننا ليس مسلم. Our religion is not Islam. We are a religious minority. أتحدث عن فترة وجود داعش حيث احتل داعش سبع قرى من الكاكية في سهل نينوى وفي جنوب كركوك. ISIS occupied seven villages belonging to the Kakais in the valleys of Nineveh and near Kirkuk. ويبلغ عدد العوائل النازحين 2178 عائلة تساوي 19,233 شخص. The number of people displaced are 2,178 families equal to 19,000 people and 233. تعرض قرانا لاحتلال داعش ولكن لحسن الحظ أنا أقول لحسن الحظ كون الناس هناك من الكاكائية كانوا لهم حس مبكر بأن قدوم داعش للمنطقة فهربوا قبل وصول داعش. The Kakais, although their villages were occupied, they had a premonition that the ISIS was on its way. So fortunately, they fled from the region before they came. داعش هدم خمس مزارات دينية لنا. فجرها. ISIS blew up five of our temples. داعش هدم العديد من البيوت وفخخ البيوت المتبقية. They demolished many many houses and they booby trapped the rest of the houses. بعد تحريرها من قبل قوات البيشمرجا وبقيادة تحالف قوات التحالف. After this area was liberated by the Peshmergas, which are the Kurdish forces and the coalition forces. عاد الناس إلى قراهم المحررة لكي يروا منازلهم. People came back to their liberated villages to take a look at their houses. بسبب التدور المفخخة استشهد تسع أشخاص. And because of the booby traps, nine people were martyred. وكانت الخسارة المادية أيضا تقدر. أكثر من 52 مليون. And the material damage was assessed at about 52 million. واليوم أنا هنا أركز في حديثي على 
آثار النفسية على الفرد الكاكي اليارساني الذي يعيش في العراق. And I want to speak to you today about the psychological effect on the on the Yasani people who are still living in Iraq. بسبب الخوف من داعش ذهب عديد من الأشخاص من الكاكية في لقاء تلفزيوني وصرحوا بأنهم مسلمين. Because of fear of ISIS, several of the Kaka'i community members appeared on television and said that they were Muslims. And after this speech, I have more stuff to say, but I would, I would like to leave the opportunity to, for my colleagues here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So now we have a sense we have so many representatives. It's, it's, we have Yazidi community, we have this is Syrian community, community Turkmen, Kaka'i. That's, that is pretty rare in itself that we are all able to sit together and understand who are these minority groups, what have they faced at the hands of ISIS. So now that we have a general understanding of those basic principles, we have such short time today. I would love to give each of you the chance to talk about what isn't being reported that your community has endured? What has your community's response been? You know, we have several flight. Certainly, we have millions of people fleeing the, fleeing the areas. We have the response to trying to leave the country or not. Do people want to go home? Do they want to stay put? What, what is the desired response post-ISIS? And, and we have the idea of self-protection. Has your community formed a militia of some kind? Would they like to be recognized by the Iraqi government? Would you like the, would you like the right to self-empowerment, self-protection? So civil questions, militia questions, questions about flight and exodus. So let's start out with, when you hear the stories about what ISIS is doing around the world and you think of what's happened in your own community, let me ask each of you, what are you not hearing? I mean, I think of the, the Turkmen chemical attack. Um, I think of the Kaka'i in general we're not hearing about. When you think of the Yazidi community, what do you wish the people in this room knew about that you're not hearing? You know, I, I think I wish that everyone would know that the Yazidis are going through a Holocaust. And it's fair to say that there, there is no gas chambers to kill people and burn people, but there is a system that persecute the Yazidis, not just by Daesh, but also in the past. For me, being an engineer, going to the University of Mosul, I was summoned many mornings to go and to explain who I was, to explain that Yazidis were not devil worshippers, that Yazidis were not dirty, that Yazidis were other human beings. That created a situation where a genocide took place. I always say that a genocide will not take place under unless it comes under many shadows, and unless there is a general understanding within that region or that communities that these people do not deserve life. I think until now, the Yazidi tragedy have not been acknowledged to the extent it is. When you have a distinctive religious minority who've been given two choices that nobody else in the region was given our choices because they say that Yazidis were not people of the book, that Yazidis were devil worshippers, that according to, to ISIS interpretation, that Yazidis' existence within the Muslim world was shame on them. I think the extent of the tragedies with the women, every single woman I've seen, the many women that I was with over the phone as ISIS was taking them, in some cases, in Tal Afar, they had, in one case, they had 3,000 women, 3,200, about 3,200 women children in three villages in Tal Afar. And they keep those villages detention centers, but not just detention, they will, the factors would come, they will go through those houses, they will pick whatever woman they wanted to pick up. I will never forget those moments, being on the phone with women as the two Yazidi women, they committed suicide in Bahaj. Two others were shot by Daesh. I will never forget looking just two weeks ago in the eyes of five Yazidi women who lost their husbands. In that same house, two medical students, medical school students, who were the best in the province of Mosul. 
the first day, they were put aside, they were killed, their, their women were taken, everybody in the family was whether enslaved or killed. To see those women, five women, with their children at no older than five years old, living under horrible conditions in the refugee camps, they have no income, no food, no, talking about the shelter, about 80%, 85% of the Yazidi population, about 400,000 people have no place to live. For two years now, they have no income. For two years now, the humanitarian aid have been decreasing every day. Many of them haven't even received dry food for the past six months. This is so essential. This is, an, this is the next phase of the story that I feel we're not hearing. And Mona, I wonder what you think. We, the casualty rate due to ISIS and minorities remains an open question. We cannot establish it definitively now. But we certainly do know that by 2016, 3.3 3 million people had been displaced by ISIS. So for the Assyrian community, driven from their homes, um, what, what does living far from home mean? What are you not hearing about this next phase of the story? Oh, it is working now. OK. okay. Um, thank you. Uh, I just want to say that um, one of the things that we need to make clear is that this ethnic cl cleansing has not just started two years ago. It's been slowly happening, and ISIS just expressed the process, okay, just made it happen quicker um, in a shorter per period of time. C could I interrupt for just one second? Because yeah. I think that's so essential, and it's tricky politically to look at that, because when you look particularly at the Syrian Christian community, the Christian community in Iraq in general, you're looking at, before the US invasion, a population of more than one million, and, and the mass exodus happening before ISIS. Right, and now we're looking at a community of what, maybe 300,000, several maybe, hundred thousand. If we're maybe, we're lucky, right? yes, yes. I mean, the census hasn't been done, but maybe. So it was 1.5 million in 2003, mm -hmm. and maybe it's somewhere between 200 and 250 right now. We're not really sure, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yes, yeah, so this has been happening uh, for a while. And one of the things that I like for people to know is there are different reactions. You know, well, you know, everybody has opinions here. Well, they should get out, and, and, um, or they shouldn't, or they should stay and, and keep the culture going. That's not our place. Mm. But the, the, the kinds of stories that come out of there um, are, are resonate, you know, the feeling. Um, and, and I just want to quote you know, some of these um, women, and I'm quoting because Asher is saying he has you know, inter yeah. interviewed some of these people, okay? Like one woman who was being moved from one place to another you know, after losing their homes. Um, if you move my family, you have to move me with all my neighbors because that's how, that's how Assyrian Christians are. They, the, the whole neighborhood or the whole village is their family. Mm -hmm. So you know, that's one thing. I mean, just, just you know, where, um, and how they're, they're coping with this is, um, you know, when, when they have escaped, they've tried to stay together as much as possible. It, it just, it gives them some sort of semblance of normality, right? In, in the middle of this whole awful, um, ugly crisis. And um, it's the only way they can cope with the loss of their homes, their families, um, and everything they know to be like human and, and genuine, right? It, it's to stay close together as much as possible. Um, so, the, from what I hear, from what Asher is saying, is that uh, we are pleading with the international community to help us um, not only just stay there and have enough food and water, but to um, to have infrastructure again, uh, to have a, some sort of a Marshall Plan um, to you know to uh, create jobs and to help us thrive again in our homeland. And we we you know we we deserve that. We are you know one of the indigenous people of the area. And um, we're not saying that pay attention to us when we say uh, that you know, Yazidis and, and Assyrian Christians um, have had a genocide done to them, and, and please help us. We're not saying that we are, our lives are more valuable than anybody else, but um, there needs to be a priority when, there's, when, when we go from 1.5 million to 200, and 50,000, mm -hmm. there needs to be a priority to, you know, to yeah. that, right? Yeah, so maybe what we'll do is come back to this question of what does a landscape post-ISIS look like and what can the international community, what, what can the international community do to make it so? And I want to reiterate something that you're saying, Mona, that is so essential because, and I've heard both our Turkmen and Kakai colleagues say this today, 
look, we're not sitting up here saying, I'm a Turkmen, I'm a Kaka'i. This is, a, this is our, our communal identity. We, we have been fractured as a people. So it's really important. It's not just us. It's we are the minorities together. I think that's really important what you're saying to hear. Um, OK, so in terms of the Turkmen community, this chemical attack has gone virtually unreported here in the United States. Maybe you could talk to us a little bit about it uh, and what you would call on the international community to do now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the chemical attack was at March 2016. Uh, Taza is a district, Turkmen district, about 20 kilometers at the south or 20 kilometers away from the center of Karku, at the south of Karku. Mostly they are Turkmen, have been uh, attacked from village called Bashir. Bashir is another site of crime and disaster against Turkmen. It was at June 2014 when, the, uh, when Daesh attacked and displaced about uh, 12,000 Turkmen. And they uh, abducted, raped about, as I mentioned, nine women and girls. So it was the site of uh, presence of ISIS. So they were already attacking or, uh, the uh, district of Taza every day or every weekly, but the government was silent and uh, because they are busy with ISIS or so, so there was no any action to stop that. At March 2016, there was a two ta two twice attack by ISIS. The aggressive one was about 22 uh, mortar uh, filled with chemical open. The total number of uh, affected Civilian was about 6,000 as a total number till today because we know that the act of chemical oven, some of it will be uh, directly and some will appear after uh, days and months and years. So till today we have around, according to the report of local medical city in Taza Hormato, we have about 6,000 civilian attacked or injured or affected by this weapon. So, and it was master gas according to the uh, official reports from lo local, official reports and from central, and even by the Organization of Pro Prohibition of uh, Chemical Open, they declared it, and there was a conference by Mr. Arshad before two months or so, they declared that it was uh, really mustard gas. Mustard gas. Yeah. So it was a genocide against Turkmen. But till today, there was no action. Mm -hmm. Some action have been taken steps by our politician to uh, send some people or uh, affect person to Turkey or Iran or so, but there was no any strategic plan to, to resolve this or to uh, take care of such peoples. And doctor, what would, what would that strategic plan look like? Because maybe that's part of articulating what is, how can we provide, how can we not only lay out the scope of the problem here, but address some of the means by which, what, what, could, what would a response look like? Yeah, first of all, uh, before three days, I heard some news from intelligent offices in Iraq that ISIS want now to attack another Turkmen city, which is called Amirli. Amirli is also in, in uh, Salahadin province, okay. and it is uh, about 180 kilometers to north of Baghdad. The problem that ISIS is still present uh, in some areas, few kilometers aw uh, away from city, city, uh, civilian habited places, so the problem that Iraqi government trying to get victory in liberation of some places and letting the other places uh, not liberated, I mean that surrounding of Amrli is still, still inhabited by ISIS, surrounding of Taza Hormatu is still inhabited by ISIS, mm -hmm. and they can attack at any time mm -hmm. because every day there is new events or criminal acts around our cities. So first of all, we must prevent because all the world talking about the ability of ISIS to form chemical open and their ownership of such open. So I think, first of all, we, we should prevent such event may, may occur at any place in Iraq. They can attack any province, any city. So the first point is to prevent. The second point is to deal with those people in a professional way. I mean, the environment in Taza should be cleaned and should be dealt with a professional way in, in by a professional organization, as I know that in, in Syria, they sent a mobile clinics to deal some uh, places or cities. After that, we need uh, giving care for such peoples. We need to investigate for uh, long-term complication. According to my colleagues in Iraq and medical city, they told me that many of them will, will develop lung fibrosis and leukemia in the future as a blood cancer. 
Um, so we need also uh, a, a medical evacuation for s some severe cases. So this is what is related to Taza Formato and what we need actually in, in okay. this issue. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And now to our Kakei colleague. Uh, the Kakei are probably, I don't know if you guys would agree with me up here, but the least heard from, along with the Shabak, who hears about what's happening to the Kakei? So this is a really good moment to hear historically about what persecution has looked like and, and what the Kakei are suffering now. I just introduced you to what the Kakai community is about. Since the Iraqi uh, state was formed in the 20s of the last century, the, the, religious, uh, the religion of the Kaka is the Yassani, the Yassani religion. Yes. Um, was not mentioned in the Iraqi constitution when, it was, when the country was first formed. Uh, and that's the reason the name is unknown to people who are not close uh, to the community. الأقليات في العراق يعرفون بوجود الكاكية كديانة ولكن الأكثرية المسلمة في يعيشون في بناطق الغير الموجودة بين الكاكية لا يعلمون من هم الكاكية. For example, although many would know that the Kaka is exist, for the Muslims who live in areas where Kaka is do not live have no idea what the Kaka is faced is all about. كما تحدث زميلي مراد عن التحدث في أكثر من مكان وفي أكثر من الأشخاص يسألوننا من أنتم أو الدعايات الموجودة عن الكاكية كانت كثيرة أيضا. It's similar to what my colleague here Murad said about his community and how people are asking him about the background of that community. We we also face the same problem and the same question. الأقاويل الغير المنطقية عن الإيزيدين والكاكية وغيرهم من غير المسلمة كانت موجودة أينما نذهب يسألنا هل أنتم عبدة الشيطان هم أنتم تطفئون الأنوار الأنوار في ليالي في ليلة في كل رأس سنة وكذلك دعايات وأقاويل غير غير لائقة تذكر فيها في هكذا مكان. Many claims were made about us that we are devil worshippers, that we have to turn off all the lights on the new year, um, and such unreasonable things that are, that are said out of ignorance. كل ذلك بسبب عدم ذكرنا دستوريا في أول دستور العراق ولحد الآن. The first Iraqi constitution ignored us and they didn't make a mention of us. لذلك نحن بعد 2003 قام نغبة مثقفة من الكاكئين والحقوقيين زيادة البرلمان Since the year 2003 a select group of Iraqi legal experts and activists visited the Iraqi parliament عملوا جاهدا لكي يذكر في صياغة الدستور في 2005 ولكن كان هناك من يعارضنا وأيضا بالتعاون مع الأكثرية استطاعوا بعدم بعدم ذكر الكاكية في الدستور أنا ذاك. And they made they made a big push for the kakais to be included in the constitution. Great. I'm going to stop you there because I think that's part of our next question, which is the solution, right? So at this point, we've heard a little bit about which each what each community is facing, who they are, what what we're not hearing about in the in the news, which is everything. We've heard about the systematic attempts to destroy different peoples. We've heard about targeted campaigns of massacre, of rape, of kidnap for ransom, and then kidnap for taking children into what, what Daesh calls the Cubs program, child soldiers. Um, I myself interviewed the mother of a three-year-old girl who was taken by ISIS and has yet to be returned uh, in the Nineveh plane. So this problem could not be more pressing or multifaceted. Now let's turn to solutions. Let's hear from each of these guys about wh what has been their community's most effective solution. Is it a civil solution? Is it a military solution in, in help forming militia? Um, attached right to that is, has it been more successful to leave the country? What, what is the reality of flight and displacement? So we will turn to that now. What has 
each, each community's response been and where has it been effective? And what we'll end with is the question of what does a post-ISIS Iraq look like? What can the international community do to safeguard the presence of, of ancient communities uh, in, in Iraq? So, so let's begin with that. I'm going to just turn to you, Murad, and ask, with the Yazidi response, what have you guys found to be effective, if, if anything? And, and what are you seeing in, in terms of self-defense, in terms of civil society? What's working? So um, I think we can, we want to identify the current situation of the Yazidi people right now. So it will be displaced, mis mistrust, not being confident to live in the homeland. If you go and ask a question to the Yazidis, anyone, they will tell you whether there will be international protection, recognition of the genocide globally, uh, and preserve my rights as a community, or the other choice that I will leave. About 70,000 have already exited from the Kurdistan region. And I think uh, if the, road, the route to Europe was not blocked, there would have been now maybe 100,000 just left in Iraq from a half million people. Um, Talking about the solutions, after now we have the resolution from the UN report that said what happened to the Yazidis specifically was a genocide, was a different treatment. Can I ask you, is that helpful? Does that have any teeth for you on the ground for the international community to acknowledge the genocide? Well, I, I, I think the international community have been lacking its responsibility. They've been dragging basically their feet not to take the case before the ICC or a tribunal court. We are pursuing a legal case. We've, we've uh, Ms. Amal Cluny is working with us, uh, Mr. Luis Marino Campos working with Yazda. We are trying to open the case before the International Criminal Court. And I think establishing justice is very important. I think when atrocities on this scale are committed against a community, the first thing you can do for them is, uh, is bring justice. And I've met many victims. The first thing they will tell you that I want what happened to me to be recognized, even if, that, if there is nothing tangible mm -hmm. coming out of it. So uh, I think the solutions are on several levels. There are solutions need to be done internationally. Solutions need to be done locally by the governments. Solution needs to be done by the Muslim community internationally. Uh, I mean, one thing that I would have expected all the Muslim in the world to come out and say that the enslavement of the Yazidi woman was not right, something that I never heard that I can challenge whoever wants to bring a question that the Muslim clerks in internationally never, never came out against a genocide, never came out and never said the rape of the Yazidi woman was, uh, was not in line with the, with the Sharia, for example. I think that's something where the Muslim world, they go into a lot of uh, chaos when anything uh, against the religion has been said internationally. I think what happened under the name of Islam by the Islamic State, which does not represent Islam, which does not represent any religion, just to be clear that. But the Muslim community have, should have came out in Iraq. Now, if you talk about the Sunni community in Iraq and Syria, the Sunni community, the tribal leaders there, they could have said no to the rape. They could have said no to the distribution of the Yazidi women. They could have said no to the Yazidi genocide, but they didn't say that. So that's one angle. I think also, for you to ask my community who just processed a genocide to find my own solution, it's unfair. How can a community that basically lost everything they possessed for three generations, four generations, every, the best Yazidi person left his home with his clothes on? That's the best situation. If we were very lucky, if we were a very happy person, and, and you, you would be able to just escape uh, with your own uh, clothes. Uh, so for, for, for the international community to ask me for a solution is not fair. I think the international community should stand up for its obligations. There must be uh, uh, clear recognition of the genocide with every parliament, with the, with the, with the public. The people, people, public should know that Yazidis were being subject to genocide. I think a, leg, a legal case must be pursued uh, against Daesh, and there must be two legal systems, an international legal system through the ICC or a tribunal court, and also a parallel system within Iraq. From my experience and from all of our experience back in 2006 and 7, when Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups were able to commit their crimes, but at the same time they were able to integrate back to the, to the political process in Iraq, this is something that my community will never accept. Mm -hmm. For anyone to bring reconciliation, I would tell them bring the justice world first before you ask for, for reconciliation. It is very painful to me when I sit with someone, while I still have 3,200 women mm -hmm. and girls in mm -hmm. captivity, they're being raped every day, it's very painful for me that you ask me to reconcile 
you know, th this just reminds me of, 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 um, of something that I actually observed with my own eyes. We had two people, uh, mentally ill people in our town, Khanasur, and one of them was beating the, the other one, but the one who was being beating to his face, he was, uh, you know, he, he was in very terrible situation, but the guy who was actually beating him, he was, say he was crying and he was saying that, come please hold me, hold him so I can escape. So what is happening that the Yazidis are the victims, the Yazidis are being beaten up, they've been persecuted, they've been given two choices, but the international community is asking for a reconciliation before even asking for justice. Mm. So to me is, you know, that justice is very important. To me is, for the short term, about 30% of the Yazidi homeland must be freed right now. We still have Sinjar, we still, but can we please come let back me, give this? me a few, okay. maybe two more minutes just to finish. Okay, and but, the, but the thing is, I think if we can lay out what the, what the long-term solution would be for the Yazidi people after we get how each community is responding, would that make okay. sense? Okay, sure. I, I, I'd like to come back to that, because I think we could say what the Iraqi constitution allows for, what a homeland might look like for minorities, if that's sure. okay, sure. yeah? Okay, so I think so far I've been really trying to keep it short. Yeah, right? that would be great because okay. we super are but running out of time. to be fair, I'd yeah. really like to give a little bit more background about Assyrians. When I'm saying Assyrians, I am talking about all three denominations. Yep. We come from the um, Church of the East, uh, Chaldean Catholic Church, and the Syriac Orthodox, and there's a few Protestant and, and, and so on. But when I say Assyrian, I mean all of that, mm -hmm. right? And I don't separate it with Chaldean, Syriac, whatever, because we are ethnically we are all, mm -hmm. all Assyrian. Okay, that's, that's number one. Um, the, and the reason I'm saying that, because all, there is a misconception out there that um, the Christians are, are being given a choice of jizya. Yes. That is not true at all. And there was a recent article by Nina Shea that eloquently stated that there's been a 278-page report uh, done by the Knights of Columbus and IDC uh, together uh, where we gather testimony and everything to show that. Um, there's been legal papers uh, done, a 35-page legal paper. All these were given to Secretary Kerry and, you know, I think moments before he was about to announce the, the declaration of genocide, you know, Christians were, were included in there. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one thing. And that's why the UN is hesitating to include us Okay. Into the genocide because they keep claiming that th that this misconception that they were given a jizya and it was extortion. It okay. wasn't jizya. That is my experience reporting in the region. That this this uh, just to make sure everybody's up to speed here on this jizya tax, right? The idea being that ISIS pr sends out promotional videos saying with happy faces of Christians saying, all I have to do is pay this small amount of money. Mm -hmm. When the lived experience is that is not at all true. It's extortion or, oh, as Jizya attacks, I'll take your three-year-old daughter. So it's not a viable, it's not, ISIS is in fact not ha allowing Christians to pay some tax that lets them off the hook. Is that? Right, okay. right. And, and this tax comes, you know, goes back to, you know, yeah. um, you know the beginning of Islam, right? I mean, it was it was a security tax, but and they're they're using that as an excuse, but they are really not offering yeah. it, or the offer is so ridiculous, like eight thousand dollars a month. It just it's it's extortion. Or your basically. child, or your wife, or your child, yeah. right? Exactly. So uh, so that's the other you know miscon misconception mm -hmm. I wanted to say you know uh, uh, to, to the world. So since um, the June of two thousand fourteen, you know the political map. Uh, in, in Iraq has changed, and the vision you know, of the people has totally changed completely about their own future. I mean, if there isn't a future, it's really, it's hard psychologically to take the next step, right? W what, is, what is the next thing to do? If I, all I'm doing is trying to uh, you know, feed my family and that's it, what, what is the next step as far as uh, career and, and future for the kids and everything? So all that is lost once that comes to a stop, right? So. It, it, when the, the, the future is unpredictable. So the security, uh, the ins you know, the insecurity uh, pushed the people to, to emigrate, you know, number one. That's why, it, you know, since 2003, the exodus has been massive and, and to the point of um, extinction, right, in, in the area. Um, and, and we have been there over 6,000 years. Uh, and, and we were one of the first groups to uh, adopt Christianity. But when you just say Christians, you are talking about only the past 2,000 totally. years, right? And you've just knocked off the 4,000 years of existence totally. there. Okay. So if, they, if they're ever um, to return mm -hmm. back home, there needs to be this confidence that we have self-determination 
um, security uh, and that we won't be abandoned again, 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 and I say that over and over again uh, um, in history. And, um, and the most recent was in, you know, in, in June of 2014 when we were disarmed and abandoned. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's excellent, and we are going to return to that. I'm going to look at Nick for a high sign on how much time we have left. Yeah, roughly 25 minutes. 25 minutes left. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. So I'm going to turn it over to questions in five to seven minutes. That's going to be the aim. Mm -hmm. um, so let's hear from both the Turkmen and Kakai community on this question. Then we're going to talk for one minute about what this. We've heard a little bit, there are a couple of regions left where the Yazidis are still strong. This idea of returning to the Nineveh Plain, what would it take internationally? So first we're gonna hear both from, from both the Turkmen and the Kakai about what effective response your community has been able to take so far, or what is working. Yeah, thanks again. <laughs> I think, uh, although I am a human rights activist, but I still thinking as a doctor yeah. to uh, put solution and to treat any disease, you must diagnose at first. I think what happened is related to something internal uh, issues and something external. An internal issue, I think there is a, a cultural problem in Iraq. There is a misunderstanding of democracy, really. There is a terrorism in their brain because I know that any movement in the hand need an impulse in the nerve cell in the brain and it will be transmitted to the hand to be moved. So I think the terrorism in Iraq is a pre present in the brain of some ethnic groups. And if we want to, as Mr. Yonadim told, that it was present before eyes and it will regain and the, the, it will appear in another phase, Qaeda, ISIS, and so on. So we must put an educational and cultural program to solve this problem. And this, is, this, is, and this way all happened by NGOs and uh, by the help of the Turkish community. Another problem is present in the constitution of Iraq. Yeah. There is a real problems in the constitution of Iraq. And the, the, the fact of a distributed area is one of it. The uh, large lands, and most of the, uh, such lands was the lands of minority, Turkmen and other minority, called as distributed area. Distributed area between who and who? Iraqi government and KRG between us and government? I don't know. Right. And who was responsible of such term? So this made the Iraqi government to be away from us, really. The KRG to extend more, to get more opportunity because they have external support and they want to extend because they have a bad history and they don't have, and they don't, don't trust to anyone. They want to extend and the other ethnic group, the same, was the same. So we have a constitutional problem and it, it must be changed. Yep. This is a problem. Another problem is the external. The problem in Iraq that there is an external intervention in Iraq from all, whether from US, from, from Iran, from Turkey, from Saudi, everyone trying to support certain ethnic group and uh, weakening of the others. This is a problem in right. Iraq. So we need a real democracy, a real uh, implementing of rules of democracy and human rights, uh, reducing such intervention. If there is intervention for helping Iraq, for helping Galaki people, it's okay. But if it is against one another, it's a problem. I think to put uh, solution about what happened and the crisis on the ground, we need mm -hmm. to divide it into short term and long term. Short term, we must, we must deal with, with the crisis, we must deal with the abducted women urgently, yeah. not just to talk. We must deal with, with uh, 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 victims of, of chemical weapons. We must deal with, with women and children. According to UNICEF, now we have about 2 million children under danger in Iraq. Yeah. Those children, for the last, for the ongoing 10 years, how, how will they grow? Yep. They will be a, a real source of criminal acts in the future. Exactly. So this is a question. I think the, the best way is to empower the local NGOs, support them, support them by training, support them by creating or establishing human rights institution in Iraq. I think, and, and this is a message from us to uh, Georgetown University, thankfully, to uh, study uh, this issue and to help the Iraqi people to establish uh, an institution specialized in human rights in Iraq or the Middle East to uh, spread the thoughts of human rights in Iraq because it is uh, absent in Iraq. Okay, this, doctor, I'm gonna, yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna wrap you up right there. <laughs> so, Thank okay, you. great. So, and because our Kaki colleague talked a little bit about the problems with the Constitution, I think that's where we wanna go now. We wanna talk about, in 
just to wrap up and then to open it up for questions. If minorities in Iraq were to return post-ISIS, what might that look like? Is the idea of a safe haven possible? Certainly, the United States is not going to support any boots on the ground effort or no fly zone. That's unfortunately the reality. So let's take it as a given that we're not going to see an international force fighting force on the ground. We are not going to see a no fly zone. It's simply too expensive. If I sat there and I were an ambassador saying, sorry, we can't help you with those things, and you said, yes, we can still have a safe haven, what does the Iraqi constitution allow for? What might self-determination and self-protection look like? What might a solution for a safe haven look like? Yeah? Mm -hmm. And then we will turn it over to you guys for questions. Yep. Murad? So I think, as principle, the system that produces a genocide, you should not ask for the same system to be established. That would be so stupid. <laughs> if you try to bring everything to what was before, and basically you prepare the ground for another genocide atrocities against everyone. So we need a different solution. That solution must be internal, internally accepted. But the fact is that within Iraq and within the culture in the Middle East, if you are the other, you, you will never be embraced. If you are the other, you will always be put on the edge. You will never be listened to. The Yazidis had eight seats in the parliament with the last election. Now we have uh, one or two. Uh, uh, and a lot of times that the Yazidi politicians will be implants, not real voices of the community. Uh, we don't have any minister, any directorate. We don't have anyone in the government. We've, we always, we always treat it as third class citizens in our, our, in our areas. We have to accept always the orders. We never allowed to have a voice, a real voice. We have, if you want to have a voice, you have to have a certain voice, not your own voice. So I think the new system must allow all the minorities to have a real voice. And you know, the, the, the conversation that the US was having, having this sort of national guards forces, something like the US system where you have like a federal system where everyone, every area is uh, in principle in charge of their own fate. I think that's a good system if we can, if we can apply it where instead of someone coming from Baghdad or from Erbil or from, from somewhere else to protect me, if I was the one who protecting my children, then I would have had just m more emotional um, uh, backing. I would have, yeah, uh, so that's sort of security-wise, but also administratively. If you have people running their own uh, staff, then, then, then you are respecting them. Then they, they know that there are someone in that. I think for Yazidis, we, we are nobody in the region. We are nobody. We are basically begging for food. We are begging for a, a place in the government. We are begging for as simplest as being mayor of our own city in Sheikhan. Uh, my sister Bayan is here. The, the, the mayor of Sheikhan was, used to be a Yazidi historically. And now this last thing is not longer a Yazidi. With the, with the Yazidi parliament members, there was, a, I don't know what happened, but the decision was that no Yazidis would go to the parliament, just maybe one person to have a certain view. Uh, so that is a real problem in, 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 in Ninawa, for example, the, the council of Ninawa, <laughs> where we had uh, six members. In principle, the, the deputy of the governor should be a Yazidi, but he will never be a Yazidi, because if you are a Yazidi, you are a third class citizen, you are not respected. So to bring that respect back, I think there must be some international parameters some international parameters working with both KRG and the Iraqi government. You cannot have, you cannot have a heaven in the middle of, a, of the hill. Like, you cannot have just a, something beautiful in a war zone where you have all areas, these areas are collapsing. So you need to, to work with all this, you know, everyone should work together to create that system. But there must be some international oversight. If we do not have international oversight, we will never have a voice because that system produced a genocide and the international community have the responsibility to prevent that from happening okay. again. Okay, so Mona, I'm gonna put you on the spot here with what international oversight might look like viably. What could the international community do as part of the solution. Okay, so um, I just want to say that um, in the words, and I'm probably not saying it, you know, uh, correctly or, or right exactly, but uh, Mr. Carl and Anderson of Knights of Columbus said, "Citizen class, citizen 
Second-class citizenship is a precursor to genocide, and that is so true. So when you're talking about third-class citizenship, forget that. Not even second-class citizenship. We don't deserve that, okay? So the overall uh, recommendations that we're talking about is, is just that, that, that we deserve to be treated as equals to everybody mm -hmm. else, okay? That's number one. So the international community, they, we need the support uh, to, uh, to the indigenous minorities, right, directly through their legitimate NGOs, right, okay. that have been established. That's, that's number one, to deliver the aid and humanitarian uh, activities, um, you know, during this crisis. Because if it's done through um, the governing powers, most of the time it's not trickle, trickling down to them because we're not in the UNHCR um, camps or, or government-run places, okay? So that's one thing. Um, empowering the indigenous minorities um, to establish safe, internationally protected zones. Okay, I mean, that keeps coming up over and over again on, on this panel. Uh, for long-term, in parallel, adopt a, um, uh, adopt and establish uh, the Nineveh Plain province with, federal, with the federal government mm -hmm. and neutralize the region between Baghdad and Erbil mm -hmm. for now. Uh, later, there could be a referendum where um, they, could, they could vote and they could be um, organized to let the people decide for themselves if they want to stay with Baghdad, Erbil, or establish a new region. Okay, but for now, it, th this is, this is mm -hmm. short term. Support local security forces like the MPU who are the only independent um, groups uh, that um, are at the will of the people. Yep. Okay. Um, and encourage them to participate in the liberation of their lands. Um, also to provide local security in the future for their own region. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and that's really the only way to get the people back home is when they know that they are being protected by their own. Uh, right. And you know, those people minorities. have a way, that militia has a way to be integrated into a larger Iraqi governmental system. Right. And so maintaining this rich cultural diversity in the region is really essential to the pe for peace to prevail in that region mm -hmm. at, at all. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. Okay, guys. Uh, I don't know. Isolated regions? You talked about isolated regions? Independent areas, like semi-autonomous areas in these regions? What? Are you asking for semi-autonomous semi regions in these areas? For now, they just need to be able to, to self-govern. Okay. okay so Later on, once things settle down, ju just yep. like uh, Murad was saying, that you know we're in the middle of a crisis. We need to breathe first, right? We need to take a breath, and right now it needs to be neutralized, and we need to be able to um, take care of ourselves right now in our own homes and mm -hmm. in our, in our own, own lands. Later on, when things settle down, people are are sec feel secure there. Then there could be a, a democratic vote as to which way to look south to Baghdad or um, to Erbil or to, you know, to create an independent province. How much time do I have? You said one minute. How much time do I have? You said one minute. How much time do I <laughs> they, spoke, they spoke more than me, so would you give me okay. compensation? You will have the right to answer the first question from the audience, but one minute now. You, you will also get the right. Solution. <laughs> أنا ما تحدث عن الثادات أصلاً حتى أعطيكم حلول جزء من الحلول عند الكاكية موجود الزميل الأزيدي تحدث عن الحلول مضمونة مرتبطة بالحقوق الأزيدي أيضاً. Some of the solutions that I can come up with. My colleague here, the Yazidis, have mentioned most of them. Okay, great. These these are the solutions. Okay. أولاً بالنسبة للكاكية أولاً الضمان الدستوري ذكرهم كديانة مستقلة. إحنا ليس مطالبنا عن الكوتا أو ال النقاط الأخرى. أولاً الحماية الثقافة المختصة بنا دستوريا في العراق وكردستان. We want the the Kakai religion to be mentioned in the constitution. It's not a matter of having a quota in the parliament or a quota of power, but a matter of recognizing that we are a community with its own independent culture. Okay, and with that, thank you so much. We have ten minutes left to ask questions. You stole my time. I am already. I am practicing. The Iraqis. I am already. I am practicing. Okay, thank you. Shukran jazeelan. Okay, so with that, we've got 10 minutes for questions. So why don't we take three questions at a time, okay? So who's got the mic? 
Yeah, awesome. So why don't you, here are three questions right here. So why don't you give the mic to these guys? Each will p pose your question and we'll take them in groups to make sure we get to as many as possible. Okay? Does that make sense? شكرا جزيلا أنا النائب حج جندور ممثل الكوت الأجدية في البرلمان العراقي سؤالي كيف ترون ما مرحلة ما بعد تحرير المناطق الأقليات وخاصة الأجدية ونحن نعيش في منطقة سنية وتحيط بنا السن من أربع جهات. مستر حج جندور أي ولا ترانسليت؟ Thank you. Uh, Mr. Haji Gundur, he is uh, uh, the representative of the Yazidi quota. The question is what the post ISIS will look like, where the Yazidis basically uh, from the four sides are surrounded with the Sunni, uh, with the Sunnis. Uh, what will be the po how the post ISIS will look like? Excellent. That's an excellent question. If you could pass the microphone. I guess the elephant in the room, I'm Penny Star with CNS News, yeah. is how should ISIS or how can ISIS be defeated? Because that's at the heart of why all these things are happening. So right. I wanted to hear their opinion on that. Excellent. And the other elephant is how can communities live together when their neighbors have turned against them? Like a post Rwanda situation. Okay, yeah. My name is Alan Mansour. I represent the Sons of Nahrain, which we've been in politics in Iraq since 91 and even before then. Is there a question here, sir? Yes, there is a question. I am very happy that the Yaz my brothers Yazidis and the Turkmens and the Khakis all thinking of a safe haven or something that is in within the Iraqi constitution to self-administrate. And I am really very sad to hear my parliamentarian from Iraq to say, I don't understand how is this gonna happen. This is a proposal that's been handed to the Vice President of the United States of America a year ago, signed by nine of the Assyrian, Chaldean Assyrian Syriac organization of that plan. I would like to give it to you. Okay, and great. also the question would be, mm -hmm. For all the panels, we need to, how can we work together, how can we work together as the communities in that region to actually accomplish this? Okay, so I'm gonna you know, turn to our Kakai colleague to ask that how can we work together question. So he has a chance to answer that, yeah. Um, defeating ISIS might be, a okay. might be beyond the scope of these guys, right? It, you know what I mean? <laughs> Uh, that's great. What kind of international response would you like? And okay, that sounds good. Okay, yes. Yes. Nick, can you give me when we've got three minutes? Can you give me a high sign? Is the yeah. gentleman going to yes. answer the question on ISIS? No, he or he can. On how to work together? He can answer whatever he'd like, but it sounds like this idea of how can we work together is something he's already thinking about. Well, and, uh, أولا إيجاد النقاط المشتركة بين المشاكل التي تخص الأقليات وجمعها في إطار واحد والعمل عليه. We must find we must find the common ground among all the problems of the minorities and start addressing these issues. ثانيا تأمين المناطق من ناحية العسكرية. Secondly, we need we need to التي يعيش فيها الأقليات. We need to secure all the areas where the minorities are living from the military and security point of views. ثالثا المصالحة الوطنية العمل على المصالحة الوطنية بالشكل المطلوب بما يناسب القضايا العالقة به. And thirdly, to effect national reconciliation in the desired way and in a manner that suits the kind of problems that have arisen. والاتجاه بمنظمات المجتمع المدني حول نشر ثقافة سيادة القانون وعدم التوجه إلى الانتقامات من قبل الأقليات. And also getting the the civil community engaging in spreading a culture to prevent vengeance and to diffuse tensions between minorities. وكذلك الحماية القانونية والدولية. And providing legal and international protection. وكذلك يوجد لدينا الآن قوات بيشمرجة للأقليات تابعة لوزارة البيشمرجة نطلب من الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية بالإشراف على تلك القوات الخاصة بالأقليات. The Peshmergas, which are the Kurdish forces. بتدريبها وتجهيزها وتسليحها قبل المشاركة بهم في الجبهات القلال كونهم. ليسوا مدربين بالشكل الكافي وليسوا مسلحين بالشكل الكافي. The the Peshmergas do not have the right training and the right kind of weaponry. And they would need help. كون هذه القوات أصلاً شكلت لحماية مناطقهم. 
the Depeche Mergas were uh, formed in the first place in order to protect Kurdish areas. Okay, okay. So with that, we're gonna we're just gonna say that that's a very important point that, that Mona touched on earlier that that the Kurdish forces withdrew from some of these areas in the advice in the advance of ISIS, so the protection wasn't there, and in other areas we've got three minutes. In other areas, uh, the Kurds have used. The advance, their own advance to take land from minority groups in order to safeguard their own interests rather than those they're protecting. We have three minutes left. We're going to take the next three questions and we're going to give you guys a chance to respond. Yeah, so. Sorry, Can I talk? Uh, Nick? No. I don't, I, we I, have three I minutes left. The things we never agree with is spoken today. And answer is not given for people. They are asking political questions and they are not politicians. Okay, so then would you like to ask, ask no, a question? I ask. I, we have a lot of comments and we spoke nothing. Yeah, welcome to a panel in Washington. <laughs> We're doing our best, you know, to articulate who these guys are, what we, you know, that's the reality, right? To, to figure out who is being persecuted and why and what can be done is a pretty tall order. Yeah. We can we can tell you because we are in the middle of a battle in Baghdad. Exactly. But no, they are angels. All right, thank you, sir. Last question right here. My name is Bayan. I'm from the Kurdistan Regional Government. Like my colleague, we're very frustrated because some accusations have been made mm -hmm. and they're inaccurate, but we can deal with that another time. My question is I agree with a lot of what's been said, mm -hmm. despite some of the inaccuracies. Um, there needs to be a protection force. There needs to be an international guarantee. When all of you speak to the international community, not us, to the international community, what do they say? About what? About what kind about of protection, protection force they'd like? About uh, self-governance. What is their response, not what is ours? Okay, so why don't we end with this question? If each of you are to articulate for your particular group, what kind of self-protection force you'd... Yeah, yeah. What is the response of the Americans? Of the uh, what did they say back to you? Okay, so what, what do you hear from the international community when you say we need our own protection force? So um, if I may just answer the questions for to go back with the Sunnis being around. I think that's what I said, the justice first. Once you have the justice, then the justice could be established by reconciliation. For your question, the international community does not stand up for its obligation to this moment. The international community's answer to this question is no, ban. So the international community doesn't have a special plan for minorities. Uh, the international community is telling the minorities to go and find your own solution. And as I said, if you, if you lost everything over three generations, if you are pe a people under persecution and a genocide, what solution you will find? And I hope this conference will, uh, will answer your question. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I think um, Murad answered that. Pretty, yeah. But there was, there was other questions as yes, well. Yes, sure. So, so I just want to say that, you know, we need, as an international community, need to be ready for post-ISIS, not plan when it's, uh, the Mosul has been liberated. So, like what happened with Fallujah, the same thing's going to happen in Mosul. There's going to be a mass exodus of people. What are we doing with those people? Do we have a plan for, for that, number one? The other one is we need to support and adopt new systems of education, mm -hmm. right, that promote tolerance toward culture and diversity and accepting others for um, different religions. So it's just a whole, you know, uh, the system of education has to be looked at uh, mm -hmm. again and, and, and uh, redone. Um, and uh, accepting of eth different ethnic backgrounds as well and having respect for each other, mm -hmm. okay? And create jobs. Uh, there needs to be investment uh, by the international community uh, to create jobs and bring back dignity and, and, to, and, and, and promote sustainability in, in the region. Um, and... Um, that's really the only way to, to, to keep the diversity in peace in okay, that area. Okay, great. So I, by my clock, we have three minutes left. Yeah? So let's give both the, the Turkmen and the Kake re representative a chance to respond to these questions. Yeah? Yeah. I think regarding the Safe Haven International Community, I know that it's not easy. No. But the problem, as I mentioned, that we were over 13 years, at least if we are talking about after change, we are like an experimental field, testing field, really. So we must at least shout and tell the reality and the facts to the others and ask what happened. And we know that at 1991, a right given to the Kurdish people and mm -hmm. they uh, got their rights by this 
safe haven or autonomy and they form their own region and so, and they are uh, living peacefully in their lands. So I think we have such right according to the Iraqi constitution and according to the responsibility of the international community as they change the uh, system at 2003. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and one minute. Yeah. <laughs> so, what is the question that he's answering? So, he, I think, from the KRG representative, I think it's essential to say, essential to say that that the Kurds have taken in hundreds of thousands of people, uh, open borders, take when when their own economy was not open to it, and so as much as there are ongoing problems. It's, it's, it's really important to express gratitude for that action and that the Kurds themselves have not gotten the support from the United States government to take on this continuing problem. So I think that's really important to say. And we're going to return to the Kakai representative. So when people, when you go to the Americans and say, we need a self-defense force, what do they say to you? <laughs> We are empty, so we know that. I'm sorry, time is really up. 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 I'm sorry, if this is going to develop, we asked from the Americans to the force of the KKK. We also asked the force of all the forces that are available to make sure that the force of the KKK is with the force of the KKK or with the force of the KKK. Okay, that's really the time that we have to put in the hands of that. We've asked the Americans to offer help not only to the Peshmergas, but to all the other uh, groups. Okay, so with that, this has been so engaging, and I have to say that is unusual. So let us continue these conversations over lunch. Thank you so much. If I could ask the panel to hang on just a second. Ladies and gentlemen, this is religious freedom in action. To the gentleman who complains that we need to leave this, sir, I'm speaking to you, that this is, these are political questions. In a democracy, uh, politics is not left just to the politicians. In a democracy, politics is the way we organize our lives together. And religious actors such as these have every right to say what they think their future should be. This is precisely what religious freedom is, and for my money, this is what we need in Iraq and Syria. So let us applause for this panel. Thank you very much.